Today on VLAMP, we're talking about legal advice for freelancers, including copyright, right to film, and how to write a contract. Welcome everyone to VLAMP, video lighting, audio, music, and photography. I'm of course your host, Matt Haslam, and today is a really exciting episode because we've never really talked about this topic on the show before, but today we're going to be covering it in depth, and that is legal advice for freelancers. We're going to be talking about copyright, how to, first off, make sure you're not breaking copyright, and how to enforce copyright if someone tries to steal your work. Um, how to write a right to film request and contract and make sure that everyone is on board with you filming at a certain location or filming certain people, um, how to write contracts with your customers to make sure you're covered in all forms of ways and including how to get paid and what time frames to get paid in. We're going to be covering all of that in today's episode. Because of the nature of the topic of this video called Legal Advice for Freelancers, though, I kind of would like to start this episode by saying that I'm not a lawyer. I am a business owner who has to know all these laws for my company and just to make sure that I'm not breaking any of them, any of these laws, and I'm, you know, 100% kosher in what I'm doing. I have to know the law, but I'm not a lawyer. And for that reason, I don't know the law across the country. So if you're in... Uh, Los Angeles or you're in Kansas or whatever state in the country or if you're in Canada or Mexico or wherever you're watching this, right? I don't know the law, the local laws that apply to you. So a really big resource for you would be to contact your local congressman or your local government. If you're in Canada or Mexico, maybe contact the government and um, your local government and say to them, here's what I want to do. How do I do it legally? Give me any information you have on all the laws that apply to me. If you're in the United States, at least, you can, contra you can contact your local congressman and say to them, I, I, I want to be a videographer, a photographer. I want to be an audio and lighting engineer. I want all, all, the, all of the laws that apply to my industry. Now, I should probably note that when I started out, this is exactly what I did. I started out in the performing world and I followed the laws that were in the performing world, but there were never really any hints. And in that first year or two, there were never any hints that I was going to be a photographer or videographer. And so I didn't even research that. And then I did it for photography and videography for fun for about a year, year and a half before actually getting into the industry professionally, t accepting money for doing it. Um, and before I started to do it for fun, even, I contacted my local congressman and I said, I want to start being a photographer and a videographer. Um, I said in the email, I'm just doing it for fun right now, but I want to make sure that I'm following all the laws that apply to me just because, right? Because I don't know about most people, but I'm a big supporter in, you know, following laws and doing things 100% kosher and you know, that way, if I'm on the side of the road filming something, I know what applies to me. And if a policeman comes up to me and says, what are you doing? I know I'm covered, right? I want that assurity that you know, there's there's no way I'm going to be on a film set and a policeman is going to come up and arrest me for what I'm doing. I don't want that to happen, right? I want to make sure I'm doing things 100% to the law no matter where I am. So when I started out, I contacted my congressman. And I said, right now, I'm doing, right now I'm doing this for fun, but one day I might want to do this professionally because I don't know yet. I, I want to test the waters a little bit with this, you know? And what are the, all the laws that apply to me on the federal level and on the state level, right? Because locally, there are no laws that apply to videography or photography because, I mean, I come from an area that's not entertainment central. If you're from New York or uh, LA or... Uh, Hollywood, you might have laws that apply to you, probably do have laws that apply to you, but I am from a little small town in Pennsylvania that 
really entertainment is the last thing on our mind. So there's no laws that apply to videographers in this area, um, at least on a local level. The state level and federal level, yes. So I contacted my congressman and they are required, part of their job as a congressman or representative or a Senate member or that kind of thing, um, they're required to provide you with all of the information that you're requesting as far as laws and stuff go. Because you wanting to know the law so you don't break it, I mean, that's... that's just, <laughs> honestly, I don't know why they would not want to give you this information. You know, you're trying to do things according to the laws that they're writing. So, you know, why would they not provide you with it? Um, I really don't see a reason um, unless they do have some sort of a vendetta with you or something, but they shouldn't. Um, because if you're going into these industries, you should probably be friends with a lot of people and you should probably not have too many enemies um, because some of your work is going to be political work. So uh, you probably want to be nice to everyone. But anyway, they're required to give you this information. And so that's what I did. I asked my congressman, give me everything that applies to the, the photography and videography world. I did say in the email that the only form of video or photography that I am not going to be involved with, the only form of videography and photography I'm, I'm never going to even touch with a million yard stick, right, is a certain form of photography and videography. Um, and for some of you out there, you might already can assume what it is. And others, well, I just don't have an answer because this is a show for everyone and I want this to be um, general audiences. But um, let's just say it's more mature in content. So I, I said to my congressman, I'm never going to touch that um, industry. I don't want to be in that industry. What I want to do is I want to film events. I want to film and I want to photograph um, graduations and I want to, you know, I want to do commercials and stuff. I don't want to dabble in that side of the industry. I, I currently know people that are in that industry and we talk specifications of cameras and we talk about, you know, um, you know, techniques of lighting, but we don't really talk about the content because we're in two different worlds, right? And I never want to dabble in their world and they really don't want to dabble in my world. So we're just friends that way. And we're tech friends, basically. Um, but I, I said to my congressman, I'm never going to do that. So you don't have to give me anything that applies to that. So about a week later, I got a booklet in the mail, a big book of all of the laws that apply to video and photo world. So I read through everything and I will grant you 90% of the laws that they actually did send me. What do you know? We're part of that world that I'm not going to ever touch. But I read through everything and just to make sure that everything I'm about to do, professionally or not, I'm following the law. And that's what's important in this episode to understand. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a business owner that has to follow the law, even if there's not a lawyer and a representative right next to me telling me, you know, what you're doing is right, what you're doing is wrong. I need to know that by heart that way I don't need that legal rep representation every single day it should also be noted that if you are going to write a contract um, you might want to run it past a lawyer or two first before handing it out to people um, especially if that's me your contract for all your jobs you're doing for instance we have a contract just for video and photography um, we have a contract for audio and lighting but if you're only in one of those uh, industries and you're going to write every contract you do is going to be this one contract written the same way, just with different description of services provided, then maybe you want to run it past a legal representative, such as a lawyer first to make sure that you're covered and make sure it's a fair contract before handing it out to a hundred customers. That's just my opinion. Um, when I was first starting out, I actually had customers that were lawyers. And so I had the, unique experience of I handed them a contract and I said you know do you mind reading it over <laughs> and 
and making sure it's fair, making sure it, you know, it's hundred percent legal. Um, because I'm just, uh, I told him point blank, I'm starting out in this industry and I need to know this. Um, I told him I, this is my first time writing a contract and I want maybe because you're a lawyer, you can read it over and make sure for me. And, you know, I'll maybe deduct, I don't know, 25, 50 bucks off the contract or something. Back then I was doing things for, um, for less because I was just starting out. So I said, you know, I'm just starting out. So I'm doing things for less money than I already should be. So can you read it over and like, kind of just, if there's a note or two for me, let me know, you know, and I'll make the changes for you, but just let me know, make sure it's all legal. And so that's maybe how you can start, but I would definitely run it past the lawyer first. Um, all that said, I'm a business owner and I don't really have the resources as a business owner. And you, I don't think no matter who you are, you're going to have the resources to have a lawyer there every time you write a contract, every time you're on a job site, having a lawyer right next to you and saying, you know, what you're doing right now is completely legal or what you're doing right now you shouldn't be doing, right? No one has the resources to do that, right? So I think you need to know the basic laws that apply to you initially before you ever do a job. And so that's what today's episode is all about. The first topic we're going to cover and the second topic we're going to cover are mostly pertaining to the uh, photography and videography worlds. And then we're going to talk, talk about um, contracts a little bit later on in the show, which kind of apply to any freelancers, including photographers and videographers. But I want to cover copyright first because recently we had someone basically take a photo of one of our photos and take photos of our cameramen and our cameras and post it on their professional website offering their services and never crediting us with that it's our cameras and our cameramen or our photo. So um, we had to do about two days of work to file the copyright claims and get this person to take it down. Um, and unfortunately, it ended with we had to contact the copyright offices and they took it down for us um, rather than this person taking it down voluntarily which is unfortunate. It's always unfortunate that that kind of stuff happens. But at the same time, this was a copyright violation and it was a false advertising um, violation. So, um, you know, things happen. But that kind of inspired today's episode. And I think no matter how far you're in this industry, you're always going to come across one or two people that do this kind of thing. And, and, and it should be noted, if a customer of mine takes a photo and shares it on their page without crediting me, it's my customer. Now, technically, technically, a professional photographer could say, that's my copyrighted material, you're not allowed to do that, and put a copyright violation on it. Technically. But <laughs> I'm not, because I'm proud that my customers are going to share my content out there. Um, I hope that they credit me. And if anyone asks them, oh, who took that photo? I hope that they would say, you know, Matt Housen Productions took that photo. And they do all the time say that. Um, I think, what is it, like 90 some percent of our customers come from recommendations from other people or something. It's crazy like that. So, you know, we are a, a very word of mouth kind of company, but, or a customer basis, I should say, but if they want to share the content, that's fine with me. If someone else shares our photos or our stuff, as long as we're credited, I don't care. If some other photographer who wants to professionally work in this industry takes our content or takes photos of our cameramen and our cameras and posts them and say, and basically advertises that all these cameras are theirs and all, all these cameramen are theirs, then I'm going to put a copyright violation on you. You know, it's only in certain situations that I really worry about it. 
Um, you can't worry about everything, obviously, but that's what I worry about. Um, but copyright basically means is that if you take a photo, it's your photo. If you um, make a painting, it's your painting. No one can come back and you know paint an identical thing and say it's theirs, right? Um, no one can go into, I believe it's the uh, Louvre Muse Museum in Paris, I believe. I may be wrong on this, and you can let me know in the comments. But no one can walk into the museum and take a photo of the Mona Lisa and say, the Mona Lisa is mine. No, it's not yours. The Mona Lisa is the painter's material, you know, not yours. You can't just take a photo of a photo or a photo of a painting and claim it's yours all of a sudden, right? So copyright is there to say, you know, I wrote this book. This is my book. You can't steal phrases from this uh, book and say that it's your work, right? There's a whole reason why there's a work cited at the end of a book or some of like that or an article. Here's my sources. That way I'm not uh, cited for uh, copyright violations, right? But let's explain further on copyright. So I think this is important to note. Just because you take a photo doesn't mean it's your photo, right? Here's what I mean. Let's say, for instance, that I take my phone uh, as crappy of a camera that this might have, right? Let's say I take my phone outside and I take a photo of the sunset. No one contacted me beforehand to say that they're going to pay me X number of dollars to go take this photo. No one... Um, no one's standing right alongside me as I'm taking the photo, handing me X number of dollars to do this, right? So it's not freelance. I'm just doing this on my own time for fun, right? Because I want to experiment. I want to uh, further my skills in the industry. I just want to take a photo, right? But I go outside and I take a photo with my phone of the sunset or whatever camera. That is technically my copyrighted material. I own that photo. And if I want, I can go out and I can sell millions of copies of that photo with no ramifications. I'm allowed to profit 100% because no one paid me to take that photo. I can go out and sell it to whoever, right? Suddenly, if, let's say, um, let's say I work for a media company. And I'm a full-time or a part-time employee of theirs. Um, for instance, I actually currently work for a television station and I'm a part-time employee there. So if I go to work and, again, if I take a video f for them with their cameras or my cameras, because I'm on payroll, they own the copyright to it. And I have to understand that. And I do. I think that's completely okay, right? That means at the end of their broadcast every night, they, they don't have to go through and say, you know, camera one, copyright this videographer. <laughs> um, uh, camera two, copyright this other video. No, they're going to say copyright whatever station they have, you know, copyright to their company because everyone was part-time or full-time employees. If it's freelance, then... Basically, it goes into this whole thing of, um, you know, you as a person, as a cameraman, own the copyright, but you're selling the work off. So it's pretty much 50-50, right? And I always say to my customers, at the end of every broadcast we do, I put copyright whatever year, Matt Housen Productions and my customer, whoever my customer was for that. Because, let's face it, anyone that's trying to steal that work later on, or if they try to take that work and upload it to YouTube, no one, first off, no one besides my customer should be able to do that legally. Um, if they post it to YouTube, I, you know, they probably talked about it with me beforehand, and I know they're going to post it to YouTube. But 
if, let's say, some other person that buys a DVD, and here's where copyright really comes in. Let's say someone, let's say I, I make this content for my customer and I make 100 copies for them. And they go ahead and they sell 100 copies out to their customers, which is perfectly fine, right? Um, let's say I'm filming a convention or something and um, part of the convention is they, they're selling copy DVDs or USB flash drives of the, the seminar today, you know, for X number of extra dollars if you want one, you know? And so let's say one of their viewers decides to buy a copy of that and then takes that copy that I made for my customer and I sold it bulk to my customer, my customer sold to them. Let's say that viewer goes home and says, you know, I, I bought this DVD for, I don't know, $15, $20 or something, you know, I don't know. But let's say they say, you know, I can make my money back on this if I just try to sell this to 100 people. Let's say I'm going to buy one copy today, but then I can take this and I can make 100 copies for myself and then sell those copies. Well, now that's a copyright violation. So what happens is now my customer finds out about it or I find out about it and we can stop them from selling copies on their own um, illegally because of that copyright. Hundred different ways you can, you know, hundred different ways you can make a copyright viola violation, by the way, but that's, you know, basically a summary of them, you know? So someone is out there taking this content and reselling it as their own original work. But now, because my production company and my customer are on the copyright of the broadcast, well, we can go after that person and say, you know, you're not allowed to sell these copies and put a cease and desist on it, right? Because we own copyright on it. No one's going to be intimidated of Joe Schmo, who might be my customer. They might not even be intimidated by the company that's hiring me or the organization that's hiring me. But because I'm a production, I have a production company as copyright on it, they might be intimidated by it enough to stop them from doing that. Because a production company that does this every day would know copyright law. Joe Schmo, who's my customer, might not. So having a copyright shared, in my opinion, is a lot better than having just one-sided. Unless you are just a production company doing it for yourself. Um, for instance, a television station might be doing a broadcast just for themselves. And then, yeah, 100% to you uh, as a broadcast company. But... It provides you a way to protect yourself against people that try to steal your work and claim it's their own. So basically, how do you make a copyright your own? Well, in my previous example, I went outside and I took a photo of a sunset. Because that my phone or my camera or whatever I have takes down what's called metadata right? It's basically saying, I took this photo at 5.03 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time on May 22nd, 2017. Because I did that, because that metadata is on that product, if suddenly I sh share that photo, someone downloads it and re-uploads it to their channel saying that this is their own original photo, I can go back and I, I can say, you know, here's this photo I took and I uploaded on this date and then they uploaded this photo on this date. They can compare the two photos and say it's the same exact photo. But because MHP uploaded it first, it's their own original work. In a case such as the one that I just had happen to us, um, someone took a photo of our cameraman and our cameras with its viewfinder behind the camera. And so we didn't upload the video yet from this event that we were doing. And the photographer that posted the photo took a photo of our camera and our viewfinder and posted it. And so the video that was ours wasn't out yet, but we still had a copyright claim on that photo of hers 
being up because now she's taking a photo of our photo and posting it as her own and making this false advertisement claim of, you know, this is her camera, which it's not. So basically, uh, long story short, if you want to take a photo, take a photo of something. But if you take a photo of another person's camera, then they're probably not going to be too happy with it. And it's copyright violation. But um, but don't post it as your professional work, obviously. Look at it this way. The way we protected ourselves in that situation was, and I, I think this is the way you should go about it. Be kind. No matter what the person's idea, be kind at first. And message them privately and say, you know, you posted this photo. It includes copyright work of ours. Take it down, right? If they choose not to respond, you can email them back and email, email them again and say, you know, if you don't take it down within a certain amount of time, then I'm going to report you. If they don't respond to that. I think you should go the next step, which is uh, with this person, they posted it to Facebook and Instagram. So you contact Facebook and Instagram and their copyright offices and say, here's our work. Here's the work that they posted. And this is a copyright violation. Could you take it down for us? Which Facebook and Instagram do have the capability of doing. So they take it down for us. If they don't, we can contact the copyright offices of the federal government and have them involved with everything. Or if someone posts it to their personal website without using Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or something like that, um, without a social media platform that they're posting it to that would uh, have access to taking the photo down, like let's say they upload it to their own website somewhere, I can contact the federal offices and they would get involved with taking it down for us. But that's the way copyright works. It helps protect you from people who try to steal your work and upload it as their own. It means that if you take a photo from someone else, you can't try to sell that photo to someone else. But let's say you go outside and take a photo on your own time. No one's paying you to do it. You can take that content and you can sell it a million times without any reppers, uh, a reprimand, right? Because it's your own original work. It's your copyright. Um, a good example of this is um, two years ago, we were filming multiple documentaries at one time. Um, we were filming Our Family Part 1. We're currently filming Our Family Part 2, by the way. So that's going to be coming out hopefully soon. But um, that's still in production. But we were filming Our Family Part 1, which is 100% copyright to my company and myself because I filmed the entire thing. Um, besides, there were a couple scenes that were filmed by the government and, and on like missions and stuff and there were like a couple photos that were taken by my family members which I credited in the credits on the on the video and that's what you have to do you have to credit everyone with what they did so um, that, that's what copyright is is just crediting everyone that's all it is so making sure that there's credit for everything but we were also filming a documentary that aired on a local PBS network um, we filmed this documentary, I, I literally, we filmed, we were there filming every interview for this thing. Um, the station filmed some interviews with us there, but we were there filming every one of them. Um, we filmed all the content for this thing. And then we took the footage afterwards because we weren't paid to make this content. And so because of the situation we decided in order to make some of our money back on this I need to sell the footage and so we did we sold our own original footage of this project later on to our customers and said here you go here's the footage we'll make this for you we'll, we'll do this for you we'll sell the footage just raw footage of it and that's the way we did things and so you know, we still haven't made 100% of the money back, but at least we got our cost a little bit under control on it. And because we weren't paid to make the content by the station, we were able to say, you know what? We own 100% copyright on this, on our original work. You edited this thing completely on your own. 
but we own the original raw footage. And so we can do whatever we want with that original raw footage. And so we did. And that's a perfect example of if you film for something for someone, um, here's an iffy thing on this. Um, because of situations like that, because, you know, I can take an original raw photo and sell it a million times. That doesn't necessarily mean that I can actually sell it a million times. For instance, if I take a photo of a family portrait or something, who in the world would want your family portrait besides you and your family members, right? I'm not going to be able to sell that photo to a million people. I'm going to be able to sell that photo to you. So it's pointless for me to try to sell that on my website to random people. But if I take a photo on my own time of a train or a, a city skyline or something, then yeah, I can sell that photo probably because it's a general photo. It's not a narrow, there's no one in it in the photo that, you know, there's no one in the photo with like a family or some of like that, or, you know, uh, maybe I'm taking a, shoot of you know a baby photo or something who's going to want to buy that besides your family so it does me no good to try to sell that on my own so um basically i'm going to sell that photo to you but i'm never going to use that photo again um other than for your projects you know let's say a year from now you come back and say i want a video made i can maybe go back in my files and find that photo of uh, of your family and i can include it in like a montage or something, but I'm not going to be able to use it for every project. Whereas if it's just raw footage of a town or something, then maybe I can use that photo of something because it was on my own time. It wasn't for clients. So my general rule with copyright is if I film it basically on my own time, then I can use it for any project I want. If I film it while I'm, if I film a piece of footage while I'm on the clock for a customer, then the only person I'm able to use it for is that customer. So on my website or on my affiliated websites that sell stock footage, um, if you see a piece of stock footage available for sale, it is a pro it, it was filmed on a project that I wasn't paid to film that project. So it's footage that I filmed completely on my own time and my own expense to pr produce it. That's my policy, and that's kind of what copyright involves, right? Because on freelance projects, it gets kind of iffy whether or not you own it or your customer owns the, the for raw footage. So what I always say is if I'm on the clock working for someone, that footage is just for them, 100%. No one else can take that footage. I'm not going to use that raw footage on any other person's project. That's it. But if I'm on my own time producing content, then I can sell that footage anywhere. Um, anywhere I can at least. <laughs> um, but that's something that maybe if you're a freelancer, you can do things on your own time and make money other ways, you know? So maybe that's an idea for you. The next thing we're going to talk about is right to film. And the first thing I want to note about this is let's say for instance, we're working for a company, mom and pop shop or a big company or um, a venue or something and they want a video or a commercial made for them or they want photos of their um, shop taken what I always do is I put in my contract a right to film request that's included in that ter the terms and conditions it says you know here's what you're going to pay me and here's the time frames uh, everything needs to be provided to you and here's what I have to provide to you for that price but part of my contract is also that I'm allowed on your location, on this property, at this address, from this time to this time, on this date, um, and I can photograph, film, and record audio of everything and anything I want within reason, right, for this project. So usually a right to film is included in a main contract for us. And it probably should be for you as well because having a separate contract is just another piece of form that another form of a contract that your customers always ha always have to sign. That's stupid to me, right? But um, it, so it's usually included in that contract. But if it, let's say uh, we just had a 
a band ask us to film their concert. And that concert was being held at a local bar. So we had a contract with the band that says, you know, yeah, we're allowed to film your band on this date, whatever. Um, and we're allowed to use your images and likeness and your recordings and the end video, right? But we also needed to have a right to film contract with the venue itself. So what we did was we wrote down, we have this contract made up on our computer of, you know, uh, here's the venue name, here's the location manager, here's um, here's the actual address that it's at, um, here's the phone number, you know, here's what this venue looks like sometimes. Um, if we're on a location that's a very large resort or something, we might say that we're allowed in these specific rooms during our time here to film. We're not allowed in any other room besides what's listed here so on and so forth, right? But we have everything in writing. And then we have a location manager sign off and say, yes, I allow you to be here and film. I'm allowing this company to come in and photograph part of my venue. Even if we're doing like interviews or something where we're putting up a backdrop, we s still have to get their written permission to be there in general and film. That's just the way things work. So we always have a location contract if our customer does not legally own the location we're filming on. Now, in the very beginning of things, when I was just starting out and making music videos and stuff, there were some locations where I went to just for fun, on my own time kind of thing, and it was locations that I didn't have a location contract with, a right to film with. And I never got in trouble for it, but you're always running that risk of what if someone spots me? What if I'm here with a camera and this could be considered trespassing? You just basically go in with as little of its equipment as you could and you try to get out as fast as possible. And I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that whole like thing. I used to do it when I was just starting out for that first year, year and a half, um, doing things for fun for my own. But Anytime I'm working for a customer, I need contracts to say, yes, I'm allowed to be here. That way, if anyone complains, here's my contract. I'm allowed to be here. If a policeman comes up to me on the side of the road and says, you know, hey, this is private property you're on. Well, here's my contract. I'm allowed to be here. Problem solved, right? And that's what a right to film is, um, especially with a venue or, or a location, right? But a right to film should also apply to not just the location you're on, but everyone that's on camera. And so basically if we're doing an interview or something or we're filming a commercial project and we have our main host of the show or whoever, right? We have them sign a contract and saying basically... Um, you know, Matt Hassan Productions, we, we never say our customer. We say Matt Hassan Productions has the right to f photograph me in video or still images and record audio of my voice, use images of my likeness and my, sh you know, my uh, silhouette, whatever, right? We say Matt Hassan Productions is allowed to film me during this interview or whatever we're doing. And they're allowed to use these images and my likeness and my recordings and, and, and these recordings in perpetuity, which means forever. There's no limit to when we're allowed to use these for. So basically that allows our customer to use this video or these photos forever. And let's say, and, and, and especially in those situations where it's, you know, you could say to yourself, well, they're coming into a room. They got out of bed that morning. They got all dressed up, knowing they're going to be on camera. They came to this location. They walked into a room with a whole bunch of lights and cameras, and they see a blinking red light in front of them, and they're talking on camera. They know they're on camera. So that should be good enough, right? In my opinion, yeah. If they walk into a room with a whole bunch of cameras, and they sit down, and they give an interview, they know they're on camera. There's no way you don't know that, right? There's no way you can say... I didn't know I was being recorded. 
no, come on, you know, especially when, you know, even if you're blind or something, you still hear the director say, you know, uh, you know, th this person interview, take one, boom, clapboard. You know, you're on camera, right? Let's just face it. But just in case you don't, we have you sign a little form before you enter that room and before you're on camera to say, yes, I'm allowing Madhouse and Productions to photograph me in video and still images, use my audio recording, whatever, right? I'm allowing them to do this and use those images and recordings in perpetuity. For events that are in public, here becomes another issue, right? So if the, the way the law works, at least in United States and in Pennsylvania, especially, um, if I'm on public ground, such as a street or a sidewalk, I can photograph anything I can see with my human eye, right? I can't use a very high powered lens on my camera to zoom into someone's window. That's illegal. But I'm allowed to photograph anything I can see with my human eye from the street. And I have to be photographing from that street. I have to be photographing my camera and I have to be on public ground, right, to do this. But I'm allowed to be on public ground and photograph anything I can see with my human eye. That's just the way it works, right, because it's public use. And so if I'm driving down the road or something... I'm allowed to have a camera on my trunk, which we've done before for different scenes. Um, we've had GoPros mounted to our trunk and to f uh, film like traffic in that way. I can use that uh, video in a green screen effect later. And that way, when we're actually filming someone driving, we're, they're not actually driving, right? We've done that before. People have seen our GoPros and complained. You know, I was a car behind you and, you know, you had a GoPro no, you're not allowed to complain about that because you're on public ground. You know, I'm on public ground. I'm filming on public ground. I'm fine doing what I'm doing. So as long as you're on public ground. Now, that doesn't necessarily apply in certain public situations. If, if you're filming a public event, then yes. As long as it's open to the public, you're allowed to photograph and film it within reason. I mean, if you're filming in a venue that the ba the bands and the venue says, you know, no video and still photography recording of, uh, allowed, then no, you're not. But if you're out in a public park, then yeah, you are allowed to do that. You know, if you're in a public park and this band is playing in a public park, then yeah, you're allowed to take out your camera and record them. Um, out of courtesy, you might want to ask them, but you are allowed to do it because it's public availability, right? Anyone can come up and watch that show. They're not restricting their audience, right? So as long as you're on public ground, you're fine. Unless it's a school. Here's where it gets iffy. We work in a lot of different high schools and uh, little middle schools in the area. And so one of the laws that applies to us is we have to put in our right to film contract that we're only allowed to film in the auditorium or the gymnasium that we're in. We cannot take a camera out into the hallway during school hours and film the students walking by. If we do film that kind of stuff, we have to make sure to only get their, uh, their chest or their legs and their feet in the shot. We cannot show their faces because they're under 18. And if we don't have permission from their parents then we cannot show that content on our channels or on a broadcast or anything, right? Because they're in school. It's still public property, but they're in school, which they have to be in school until a certain age. So they have to be there, right? It's not like they walked, came out, came into school that day knowing there'd be a camera there and, you know, walked into a room with a camera. No, they're walking in a hallway of their school. They don't expect a camera to be there. You know, so in schools, we have to be very, very careful of where we film, what we film and how we show it. Um, we have to make sure that the rooms we're filming in are closed down while we're filming and stuff. And during the actual event or a concert that we're filming, then, you know, we do something extra. Anytime we film a public event, 
that people go to, um, even though it could be a public event that's for free or for a dollar or two admission, doesn't matter. We, it is a public event, so we're allowed to film it, but we always put up these signs. Um, warning, filming in progress. All those who enter uh, Grant's Madhouse and Productions the right to record them in video, still photography, and or audio recordings in connection with the production. MHP and our clients can use these recordings in perpetuity. Thank you, MH, MHP management. Right? So we put up these signs outside the venue. That way people that come in know we're recording. Now, a couple locations are actually uh, set up in a way that the people walk in and they're walking right past a whole bunch of cameras in the back of the room. You know, if you complain later, oh, I, I didn't allow you to film me. Come on. You walked past a big sign that said filming in progress. You walked past a couple cameras that you knew were cameras recording the event. Come on. Be serious. And it's a public event. So you have no right to privacy at a public event. I've had event an event or two where someone came up to me and said, um... You know, I'm on the uh, witness protection program. And I don't really like being recorded. And I say to them, honestly, your best bet is to sit behind the camera. But I do have to warn you, uh, for events that I film at least, we have up to 10 cameras in the room. So I say to them, there's 10 cameras in the room right now. And I cannot guarantee you with absolute certainty that one of them is not going to record you during the show. Because they're aimed in different directions and... I can't guarantee that. So if you want, you can talk to the people that are in charge of the event and maybe get your ticket moved to a different night of the show. That's the most I can do for you. You know, if you don't want to be seen in public, then don't come in public. You know, that's pretty much all it is. It's as simple as that. But if it's a public event, we're allowed to film it and, and it's on public property, then fine. Bring out your camera and film it. But if it's on private property and your film and and it's a public event on private property, then you need permission. But um, anytime we have a show or something like that, we'll always put up these signs, and that way it's understood we're filming. We also have an announcement that's made before the show of there's a videographer here today recording the entire event, multiple cameras, and so on and so forth. That way everyone understands. Um. One of the things that was recently brought up to us by someone um, was he, he, they they complained, oh, you know, you use the back, you film the back of my head during a concert, and I can see my head as a silhouette in the video. You know, come on. First off, we have these signs. It's a public event. No, come on, <laughs> be serious. And then they said, well, those signs weren't in Spanish. Do you, re do you only speak Spanish? No, I speak English. Well, then you should be able to read them. Um, you don't need it in every language. You need it in a general language of wherever you are. Let's say, you know, you're in, I don't know. Let's say you're in China. You should have signs up in Chinese, right? Or the main language of the country you're in, right? If you're in America, English is the main language right now, currently. You should have it in English. You don't need it in Spanish and all these other languages, you know. English is good enough. Just enough to prove that, you know, I warned you before you entered that room. But I also do something further than all this. I why well, I, I take a picture of the doorways on the inside, uh, coming into the location with these signs up clearly. I take a picture of that. That way I have photo evidence of my signs being up outside before people walked in so i also do that but another thing i do is with any location i have them sign a contract after i leave that location after all my equipment's out everything's all done i have them sign a contract that i'm returning the location in the same condition or in better condition than what it was given to me in that means i didn't break anything i didn't rip up the carpet at any pl places i didn't break anything i didn't you know, scratch the walls or anything. I'm returning the location in the same condition as what, what it was given to me in. So 
I have it in writing. I also take pictures before I load any equipment in, and I take pictures after I load everything out to say, here's photo evidence, everything's the same. And I have a contract with your location representative that I didn't break anything. So a year from now, they can't come back and say, well, you know, I think the carpet was actually ripped up a year ago when MHP was here filming. No, I have a contract and I have photos. So that puts that kind of to bed right away. The last thing we're going to talk about here today is contracts. I will say that I, when I first started out writing contracts and I first started out doing this professionally, I only had a little receipt pad that I bought from my local um, convenience store. Um, and, and it was basically just one of those receipt pads where everything's like a white paper and then a yellow paper for a color copy or something, you know. And I started out with that. I wrote one contract up that way, just handwriting it down. And still to this day, I still use the numbering system from that original receipt pad. But um, the second time I wrote a contract, I actually typed one up on Microsoft Word. Nowadays, we write them up during using Microsoft Excel, which is still a very cost-effective way to write them up rather than a professional program. And they still look really professional. And honestly, 90% of the customers we have require a typed out printed version that way they have a professional receipt they don't want a handwritten thing so we give them that we give them a typed out version um but having everything in writing helps everyone in the end we wouldn't have shows like judge judy or any of these other shows on tv if everyone had everything in writing simple as that you want everything in right. Cover what each party is responsible for during the entire uh, term of the contract, when the deposit is due, what you will give the customer for that price, uh, when the final amounts due. Write everything down in that contract so everything's clear. Uh, cover things like if equipment is damaged by the customer, what happens, who pays for that damage um, to be repaired. Um, if they own the location, write in that right on the contract that we're allowed on this location from this time to this time and we're allowed to film there. Um, we're allowed to safely set down our equipment and give enough time to properly pack in our cases so it's not damaged on the way home. Um, we're allowed to be there and we're not allowed to be rushed out the door. Um, write in things like where you'll park. We're allowed to use the closest door to the room you'll be in in order to load in rather than loading things in on the other side of the building and having to, you know, carry all of our cases across the whole place. We're allowed to use the elevators if we need to use them. Um, everything, everything in writing. Um, we're allowed to have our vehicle parked to load in uh, right next to the door, and then we have to move it to another location during the actual show or whatever. We have everything in writing. Everything. Because we have to have everything in writing. Um, but it's important to say here that contracts aren't for everything. Sometimes you just need to give a receipt to someone. And sometimes a handwritten thing is better than a printed version. Um, let's say if we're doing a show and we're selling merchandise in the back of the room, we just have a little receipt pad and our uh, merchandise people write up a little thing, a handwritten receipt that, you know, here's what you got and... Uh, here's how much it costs, and here's what you paid, you know? Uh, that's what they do in restaurants a lot. But you don't always need things printed up version of contract. You don't need them to sign off that they paid this amount. You just need a receipt sometimes, and that's okay. What I always do is um, I have a contract initially with people, and once they pay the deposit, I send them a receipt of here's how much your initial contract was for, here's the amount you paid in a deposit and here's how much you still owe. And then when the final amount is due and they pay the final amount, I send them another receipt and I say, you know, here's how much your original contract is worth. Here's how much you paid in deposit. Here's how much you paid in final amount. So everything's paid for and your balance is zero. Not every customer needs a receipt. Some of our customers are like that person at the grocery store that, um, you know, gets a receipt from the cashier and just throws it out or says to them, I don't need the receipt, throw it out for me. That's fine. Some of them don't need a receipt. 
but they appreciate having you providing it to them, right? They appreciate you saying, you know, here's the contract, here's a receipt for this payment, here's a receipt for that payment, so on and so forth. That way, everything is in writing that, yes, you paid this amount. And I always email these receipts to them that way they can keep them forever and it doesn't cost them anything to keep the receipts. Um, if they want to print them out, they can print them out. But if they don't, they don't. And that way everything is in writing. That way it offers a, a way to legitimize everything I'm doing of, you know, yes, I have confirmation you paid this amount. That way if later on I come back and say to you, you know, I, I don't remember getting this amount from you, they can send me that receipt and say, hey, you, I, I did pay you this amount. You confirmed that I paid this amount, right? So now it's fair to both sides of, yes, I paid this. No, I didn't pay that, you know? Honestly, I started out using Microsoft Word. And you don't need these huge programs or anything. Nowadays, we use Microsoft Excel, which is just as professional. All you have to do is basically what we do. Um, on the top header where we have the header of the Excel sheet, we have our logo and then a uh, right column, a uh, little picture of all of our information, like our address that they can send their payments to, our EIN number, our um, phone number, our email address, our website address, that kind of thing. That way all that information is on every contract. And then we just have everything typed out for here's what your order is for, and then at the very bottom, here's how much uh, your order is for, how much the labor is, how much um, the total amount is, or uh, delivery fees, and then how much the total, total amount is. Here's how much you owe in sales tax. Add that all together. Here's your total amount due. And here's how much deposit is for. And we also include like payments on it of here's how much you paid. And that's subtracted from your total amount due. Right? Everything's in writing. They sign off on it. Terms and conditions are on page two of it. A diagram might be on page three of it. Everything is in writing. And so it looks professional, but everything's typed up. And, it, and some people appreciate everything being typed up. I know for me at least, being so young in the industry, especially when I was younger, offering a printed up version of my contract offered this way of, yeah, I'm professional. I'm not just this. 15 year old kid doing this for fun anymore. I'm, I'm not just this 12 year old that wants to take advantage of you and wants to get everything paid in cash. Here's a receipt. I'm counting this. You know, I'm doing this professionally. Nowadays, uh, even nowadays, I'm a 24, almost 25 year old, and I still want to prove to them that I'm a legitimate company. That I, well, I, ha I have a legitimate company. Honestly, most of my customers, even though most of them don't need a receipt, I give everything in writing. I, I give them receipts because they appreciate that. Most of my customers are big companies or agencies that they need everything in writing in order for them to send the invoice or the contract over to their, to their uh, department of their company or their agency that just writes checks every day. That's all they do. So everything needs to be in writing and then everything needs to be printed out rather than a handwritten contract. Nothing can be handwritten with some customers. Other customers, it's fine. But still, having things in writing goes so far. If you have things in writing, nothing can be uh, disputed later, right? Some people I know have contracts that are just one page and say, um... You're going to get XYZ package. Well, then later on, that customer can come back and say, what was XYZ package? I never knew what that included. Well, if you have it in writing and you're on your contract, here's exactly what you're getting. You're getting this many of this. You're getting this many of that. Um, if it's all detailed out, then yeah, I gave you everything I you paid for, you know? Nothing can be disputed if it's in writing, right? And signed off on. Another thing to include here is that a lot of people try to hide certain things and say, well, if you don't want a contract, I can offer it for a little bit less if you're willing to pay in cash. I report everything. 
I want everything in writing. I want everything I have an, a payment for or a receipt for in writing. One thing I should say is that we have literally, I think, over 100 services available. We have hundreds of different products available on our affiliated stores. Some of them are only $1. Some of them are only $0.99 cents that you can buy our products for right now. But I'm reporting every single sale that we make. If you buy something from our stores that's a dollar, I'm reporting it. I want to give you a receipt for that, right? Because it legitimizes everything. It says, I'm a professional and you had this expense, so I want to give you a receipt for that expense. That way you can say you had that expense later. So contracts offer a way to make yourself look more professional and make sure nothing can be disputed later. It helps you um, get out of lawsuits if someone's trying to uh, trying to have one against you. It helps you so much in the end. Taking five minutes and spending 50 cents making a contract and printing it up and signing it will save you thousands of dollars later and thousands of hours later trying to get out of a lawsuit or whatever. Like I said, we wouldn't have shows like Judge Judy or any of them if everyone wrote down everything in writing and signed off on it. So now that we talked about copyright, right to film, and contracts, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I am, of course, your host, Matt Haslam, and this is VLAMP. If you have any comments, suggestions, or uh, questions on this topic, please do comment them below. Um, if this is on Facebook, you can also go to our YouTube channel and subscribe for more episodes. We have a 100th episode coming up in just six episodes. That's going to be spectacular, and I cannot wait to show you it because um, we're already working on it. So, um, honestly, like I said, if you have any questions on legal stuff, contact your congressman and get all the laws that might apply to you in your area. If you have any questions on a very specific legal matter, before you start handing out 100 contracts, have a lawyer look it over. That's my best advice. I know it costs money to do that, but do it. It's worth it. But um, once you get going, you should know some of these laws by heart. That way you can be on location and do things on your own without having a lawyer right there. So that's today's episode. I hope you enjoyed, and thank you for watching. Have a good day, and bye.